dear friends of the show, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, welcome to the show that Andrew Lloyd Webber pre-1985 doesn't want you to hear. <laughs> it's monkeys and playbills, y'all. <laughs> One might even say vintage. Yeah. <laughs> vintage Andrew Lloyd Webber does not want you to hear. The brilliant composer who was active from the early 1970s to 1985, who for some reason died, does not want you to hear this show. <laughs> <laughs> It's Monkeys and Playbills. This is a show where we talk about Broadway musicals that had runs of 100 performances or fewer on Broadway. And what the heck happened? I'm Paul DeGers. I'm Jillian Willems. And joining us today, our first returning guest, our first guest for a second episode on Monkeys and Playbills, we have the unstoppable, the inimitable, we have the unstoppable, the in- inimitable, Inimitable. Nelson Oh, Nelson, it's so good to have you back. It's so great to be back. What are we talking about today, Nelson Bettencourt? Dude, dudettes, dudes. <laughs> we are talking about bad Cinderella, or as I know it on my side of the pond, Cinderella. Well, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Cinderella. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You knew it as Cinderella. And it's pretty bad. Yeah. It was, uh, when they actually came out with calling it Bad Cinderella, I was like, this could not be more appropriate. This title could just not be I'm almost positive more. you messaged the group. I've texted you guys a lot. Like, every time something, like, big has happened, I was like, guys, you need to read this, or you need to see this, or here's a piece of information. It's been a few years in the making, where, Nelson, you saw this production in the UK, where it originally, where it originated, and you texted us saying, y'all, I saw... Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cinderella. It's <laughs> wild. It's a wild time. We need to do an episode on it. Yeah. Let's wait till it transfers to Broadway. Then it transferred to Broadway and we were like, okay, let's just wait because we're pretty sure it's going to close. We'll get into the whole story. But the point is, this episode has been a long time in the making mm-hmm. and we are absolutely thrilled to be able to end our uh, Monkeys and Playbill season with this episode. I think it's perfect. I mean, I remember seeing it and watching it and being like, if this does go to Broadway, I have a feeling that this would be a perfect Monkeys and Playbills episode. It is a perfect Monkeys and Playbills episode. Yeah, uh, but I mean, we have a lot to talk about. (laughs) So much. (laughs) So why don't we start with our dates and then we'll get into it. Absolutely. Bad Cinderella, as the name suggests. Previews began at the Imperial Theatre on February 17th, 2023. It opened on March 23rd, 2023, and it closed, or, ooh, well, I guess it will be closed at the time of the release of this episode, but we're recording this two days before closing, which will be on Mm -hmm. June 4th, 2023, after 33 previews and what will be 85 performances. Oof. This is not the first time we're covering a show that is still running because we did our Broadway closures check-in a few episodes ago. But this is still a very significant, a true under 100 that we have watched happen Mm -hmm. and has posted closing and we're recording the episode just as they're going into their closing weekend. Yes. We've tackled a lot of shows on this podcast, y'all, with lots of different, we've, uh, you know, through the course of this podcast got to tackle good shows, bad shows, shows that I like, shows that I hate, um, (laughs) all sorts of different content. This show's the worst. I hate this show. Okay, so here's the thing that I just need to say okay. about the show. Say it, yeah. just say and I think it's it's the thing that first of all I'm gonna say I'm gonna say two things. First <laughs> thing I'm gonna say, everyone who's working on that stage is working really fucking hard. Oh, yes, right? correct. Really hard. And I feel like a lot of the time and, and with a lot of the reviews that I read, sometimes they bash the performers. Oh. And you know, some of the performances weren't great, but the thing is though, they were all working hard. With mm-hmm. the material that they had. Yep. Yep. 100%. But end all, be all, every time I look at a problem that was within the show, it always, somehow, the, like, when I followed that little breadcrumb or that little trail, the place that I always got to was, I don't think the show knows who it's for. Mm-hmm. Yes. The, I think that can be the overall arching with all the problems within the show if you get to like well why does that happen and then why does that get to there and blah 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 and eventually you get to the point where we don't know who the show's for and so we've just picked one we've picked something i 100 percent agree and that is why i think the show actually failed yeah mm. we, you should we should all say what our feelings are right now yeah mm-hmm. on this show just bear all and then as we go through the different aspects of the show We'll try to convince each other of our viewpoints. 
our knee our knee jerk gut opinion on this show. Yeah. And our relationship with Andrew Lloyd Webber going into this. Ooh, great. Oh, that's good. Okay. Because okay. this is the first Webber we've covered on this podcast somehow. Uh, technically, but even oh yeah, with other than Phantom. other than other than Phantom, yeah. But but like. But that seems different. Oh, it's absolutely different because Phantom's <laughs> like just at the end, or in my opinion, like just at the beginning of just at the end of Andrew Lloyd Webber's brilliance. Yes. And in my opinion, is just like the start of the downfall. Whereas this is not not recognizable. Right. Sure. You know what I mean? It's wild to me. Anyways, but. So that's, I guess that's my, that's my opinion. And that's where I'm starting is I thought this show was bad, bad, bad. I don't like it one bit. Could have something to do with the fact that I was doing most of my study for this after coming home from conducting Billy Elliot the Musical every night. And Billy Elliot the Musical is a really nice show, in my opinion. It's put together right. really well. It's structured really well. And this show's such a fucking slog to get through. <laughs> like, so my relationship with Andrew Lloyd Webber leading up to this was, I really love early Andrew Lloyd Webber. Mm-hmm. Unequivocally, no caveat needed. I think Jesus Christ Superstar rules. I think Joseph rules. I think um, Evita rules. So I so I bring this all up to say, like, I'm more of an Andrew Lloyd Webber person than a lot of my colleagues, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I like, I, I'm in for Starlight Express. I'll go see Starlight Express any day of the week. Like, song and dance. I dig, I dig a lot of it. But, oh, something starts to happen after, uh, as we get into the late 80s. I think the most significant devolution of a composer we've seen from brilliance to what is, in my opinion, like barely a musical. But if you look at like other composers too, I mean, look at Sondheim when he was in his heyday and then mm-hmm. post yeah. what was, um, was Into the Woods his like last biggest show or no, he had one after. Well, he had Assassins uh, Assassins. a few years later, five yeah. years later, maybe. Uh, but then it was like Bounce or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Which has yeah, gone under never really several went. names. Passion, I suppose, Passion was and... in there. So I feel like there is a trend of maybe, I mean, I'm basing off of two composers, so maybe it's not a trend, but there's some point where they reach a high point, And is it just that they can't reach that point again? Or have they gotten to a point where no one will tell them no because they've already had so much success that no one's there going to be like, don't do that. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. I think Sondheim is such a great comparison point for how opposite it is almost because Sondheim also, you're right, had a peak and then kind of a downward trajectory. But even on the, like his peak to me, it's fascinating that his peak is in that late eighties, early nineties period Mm -hmm. that kind of starts with Sweeney. And we've, we've, done a lot of Sondheim on this podcast at this point that that starts with Sweeney and like goes on to do Sunday Into the Woods Mm -hmm. Assassins which are like some of his best work undeniably like is the top of his game you know what I mean like but is also kind of such a beautiful epilogue for his career certainly not the how is this even the same composer thing that happens with Andrew Lloyd Webber so that's your thoughts feelings uh, and that's my relationship with Andrew Lloyd Webber going into this is like I'll listen to um, Jesus Christ Superstar any day of the week want to do it want to work on it I'm just so fascinated by this huge powerhouse who devolves so significantly Mm. Nelson what about you to be honest I've never done a Lloyd Webber I've never done a Lloyd Webber so I don't know what it's like to be in one to be honest the only one I think, you know, I, I don't say that. I like I'm the only I say the only one I want to be on would be Jesus Christ Superstar. But you know what? Mm-hmm. When an actor's desperate and you get offered a Joseph, you take a Joseph. Take a Joseph. <laughs> you take a Joseph. You know. <laughs> a Joseph starts at seven thirty. You're out of that theater by nine thirty, man. Yeah. You're at the bar by ten mm. o'clock. Exactly. So I mean, uh, uh, look at look at all these one acts that are coming out these days, and I'm like, they're on to something because they get you home by ten. Yes. Yep, and if you can tell a full story in an hour and a half and still pay full Broadway price and be content with like a 90 to um, 90 to 105 minute show, like I'm like, good, great, amazing. I would love to be home before 11. But you're not, you, you're not a, there's no shows you're ride or die for, for Lloyd Webber. Nah, I mean, Jesus, I, yeah. I, I do love Jesus Christ Superstar. It's yeah. so, it's a great piece of theater so and the good. music's insane, so but um, I just, it's just not my, it's it's not my favorite. I think there's some really good music. I, I, may, I may, get sh- I may get hate for this, but I think there's some really good music in Love Never Dies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually, uh, okay, I can agree with that. I, I saw it in Germany, in German, and to German. be honest, I loved it because That'd be better I, in German. I mean, I was watching it as like an opera because I was like, I have no idea what's going on and there's no subtitles. Yes. So I just kind of Googled the story being like, hey, what, what am I going to watch? And then I watched it and it was beautiful, but I was watching it like an opera. I wasn't watching it like a musical. So maybe that was also context, but 
And, but it was a beautiful piece of theater and the music was absolutely gorgeous. And what was your initial reaction to seeing Cinderella? Oh, I mean, I really did not like it. <laughs> I just, I, I just didn't. There was bits where I was like, they, they, had, they had some, there was good comedic bits and the um, stepmother and the uh, queen were very well-written characters mm -hmm. because their comedic bits worked both on Broadway and in the West End, yeah. and that carried through. But it just didn't. It, it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jill, what's your Lloyd Webber relationship? Mm -hmm. I'm very curious. Okay, so growing up, we had very few things that my mom liked to watch. But one of those things was Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> like the OG movie? <laughs> the OG movie. Cool. She had also seen a tour with Ted Neely, OG sure. Jesus. Yep. So she had this really strong connection to it. And I don't think I fully appreciated how great the show was until I was like in adulthood. Until we had a couple years there where there were a few different productions. Like there was the John Legend like live one. Yeah. And then there was also that arena show in, I think it was London with yeah. Tim Minchin Tim and Mel C. Yeah. I didn't really start to get into it until those releases. But I, so I came to Lloyd Webber a little late. That was right around the Canadian, the Broadway cast as well, right? Like the, the Stratford. I think it was, yeah, it must have been right yeah. around that time or even just maybe a year later. Like it was all really close in succession. So as Canadians, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's when I got into it. And I admit, I think I was um, not oh. interested in liking it because there was so much other Lloyd Webber I had started to research that I was like, this is garbage. Like what's going on? But then, of course, you look to that work and you go, oh, well, no wonder people love and trusted him enough to keep giving him money to do shows. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that was the initial takeaway. I have a theory about why that's good and everything after that has been sort of trying to reach that. Yeah. Um, it's more of a question, actually, because yeah. I don't know much about his upbringing. Yep. I don't know what his, like, was he born into money? Like, I don't know his right. circumstance. But I'm I'm often curious as to whether, like, the privilege... so. If he was in a position where he needed to prove himself early in his career, and so he he was sort of had that fire under him to create something really fantastic, and he worked hard and he like executed this brilliant rock show, mm -hmm. and then he made like a really decent chunk of change off of that, oh, right? Yeah. If not his first three, definitely off his first five. If you do Avita, Jesus Christ, Joseph. And then include Cats and Phantom in that. Right. So what are you actually writing for when you've done that? Do you know what I mean? Like, I just wonder why he's writing unless it's like he just has to write stuff, but he feels like people need to listen to it. It's like, you know, you can just journal. Like, <laughs> like literally. <laughs> you, you know, you could, you could just keep it to yourself, man. Like, you don't have to. Like, take, take, take the Sondheim route. Release a couple books. <laughs> Fiddle around with a little mu with a little musical for like twenty years. <laughs> I don't know. That's my my feeling on his more contemporary works. I did like School of Rock. Have you guys seen School of Rock or watched it? School of Rock's not bad. I agree. I I just didn't hate it. And I and I saw that one on Broadway. And I was like, and I remember watching. And I was like, I was watching some really talented kids. So it's again, I feel like with him, it's a hit and miss. But I mean, he was working off like mm. uh, the movie, and I was gonna say, um, and the the characters were already like pre developed. He was working from not I wouldn't say a book that already worked, but he was working from a script that clearly functioned well. So all he needed to do was be, figure out how to translate it onto stage, and that one was successful. It is. It's it has a reason to exist. Mm. It's not Andrew Lloyd Webber's School of Rock. It's actually him. You know what I mean? Like it was him yes. working for hire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and frankly, it works better than anything he's written in the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. It certainly has more of a reason to exist than whatever this is. So let's talk about the synopsis. Yes. So we are introduced to Belleville and uh, we are introduced to people who are beautiful and we are set up in, we're being set up for the world that we're about to enter. So these people are beautiful. Everyone's beautiful, chiseled bodies, um, fake. I'm thinking Capital from uh, Hunger Games. Ha! Sure. Ooh. Totally. And it's a monarchy. There's a... Like a, a monarchy system that rules this, that rules Belleville, Ontario. Prince Charming is dead. Yes. But it's okay. We have um, his younger brother, Prince Eric Andre, is here to, um, uh. <laughs> to, rule, to rule over things. 
<laughs> oh, because in, I thought I thought that was gonna. That was you gonna were crush. so proud of yourself when you came up with so that. I was so proud of that joke. I <laughs> bet the viewers funny. at home are slapping their knee right because he, the actor playing him, kind of looks like Eric Andre. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Guys, five minutes. We gotta do this. I know. Okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then they're all singing. They're all happy. They're hoping to win the prize for the most beautiful town, but then they reveal the prize, and it's been vandalized. It's been vandalized by bad Cinderella. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who is Cinderella, but she looks like she just came from a production of We Will Rock You. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right? it. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say she looks like Nymphadora Tonks in all Absolutely. of the Harry Potter films. Yeah. And then they go after Cinderella because they're unhappy with her. So then they have the pitchfork moment. Yep. <laughs> which is very circa um, uh, Beauty and the Beast. Yes. Like, you kill know, like, beast. let's go get Mob song, Kill the yeah. Beast. <laughs> Mom song. Yeah, yeah, that's what that was. Yeah. And they tie her up. Then it's revealed that Cinderella and the prince are actually BFFs. Yeah. And she sings uh, She sings the breakaway pop. Bad Cinderella sings the song Bad Cinderella. Then we meet the prince. And yep. then... Uh, they have chemistry. And then we, we meet the stepsisters and the stepmom. We go to the gym. Oh, yeah, we go to the gym. We go to the gym and we sing a pointless song about how everyone is ripped. And the men wearing... Like, uh, the leather daddy, like, look was yeah. extra. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then we're over to the queen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then she says that the prince has to marry by Sunday. The queen is played by Carolee Carmelo. Here we are um, for another episode of Carmelo cast, and she's just radiant. Well, actually, the stepmom is played by Carolee Carmelo. Fuck me. Uh-huh. That's right. They're, like, the same character. They're so That's similar. That's true. Then I don't know. And then there's just a bunch of bullshit like, uh, yeah, as they're getting and- ready to go to the ball. Um, everyone's mean to bad Cinderella. And then the queen, or no, not the queen. The stepmother convinces Cinderella that the prince would never love her because she's too ugly. Yep. And so she shouldn't go. That's the reason why she shouldn't go to the ball. Side note, bad Cinderella is gorgeous. Yeah, is, for the yeah. record. So, so let that be, let that yeah. be known. She's she is like a stunning. Knockout. Yeah. <laughs> so then she's like, so then somehow she takes... She, uh, her stepmother has whittled into her brain and has said, and has convinced her that she's too ugly. So then she goes to the fairy godmother to get plastic surgery. Yep, the godmother is the plastic surgeon <laughs> in this one. Mm-hmm. And then eventually she oh gets the plastic surgery. She puts on a blonde wig and then she's like, that was the plastic surgery. Yep. Then she goes to the ball. Now we're in active. So she yep. goes to the ball now. Yeah. Ball. Who doesn't like a ball? Um, or two. Uh, <laughs> and this, this is all typical Cinderella bullshit. Um, Prince Sebastian doesn't like all the other suitors. He's waiting for C- Cinderella to show up because he's going to pick yeah. her. Mm-hmm. For bad Cinderella to show up. and But doesn't realize when he sees bad Cinderella, doesn't realize that it's her because she looks different. And then they dance and then eventually like a slip of a foot and she and he like picks her sister instead of her. Yeah. And then she gets mad and runs off. And he's like, oh, no, wait, it was you the whole time? And then she's like, yeah, bitch. <laughs> and then runs off. And I'm just like, at this point, I was like, oh, my God, I can't. Less than a minute. Okay, a bunch of, oh, a bunch God, of bullshit. We we're, we're at the wedding. We're at um, the stepsister and Prince um, Sebastian's wedding. Prince Charming shows up. He's not actually dead. Aha. Uh-huh. Not dead at all. Um, but he does an enormous amount of stuff. Adds like 20 minutes to the show. And then he's like, don't worry. You don't have to marry this woman who you don't like because I'm going to marry the person who I like who happens to be... A man, because he's yep. the whole Great. And he's a homosexual. Yay. Love it. We love it. Yep. So then he marries them. The wedding bells go off, and Cinderella's thinking, oh my god, I missed my opportunity. And then eventually her and the prince eventually meet up, and then uh, she's like, oh, so I heard you got married. And he's like, oh, actually, no, I didn't. And he's like, really? Okay, I guess we're going to be best friends then. And then we're kind of in love. Are we best friends or in love? I don't know. And then the show's done. Literally. Yep. Yep. And that's bad Cinderella, and it's... The plot is Cinderella, but worse, and it doesn't make sense. And I was left the whole time being like, "What? What are? What? Why does this exist? Like, what's the point?" <laughs> like, I've Jill, you and I, or and Nelson, jeez, all Nelson three of us, was there. Me. Yeah, we've yeah. all had the opportunity. We worked on a production of Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella, which is, and that's a that's a show that was like it's ad- adapted from the television production. It's a uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein's television musical that was kind of filled out in the mid two thousands to be a Broadway style musical, and that's a pretty straight down the middle retelling of the Cinderella story. I would say, yep, and it just works. There's like no question, like why is this supposed to exist, even as just an old fairy tale? It kind of plays well, and this the whole time I was like, why do we? What what are we doing here? Yes. Like it's, it's maybe it's a little bit about beauty standards and beauty on the outside, but the show certainly doesn't do anything to work on that or unpack that or in yeah. any meaningful way. 
Oh, oh okay. God. I'm gonna try to stop being such a grumpy Gus about this. Gus about this show, but I guess there's no there's this show's not up for licensing. So like, do you do do we have a synopsis? Still? I do. Okay. okay. So what I decided to do for this is to actually go to the show, the Broadway show's website, and see what they say about themselves. But even the marketing team got fired, and like oh, they yeah. probably changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get, oh, we'll get into all of that. On the website, the first thing that pops up is like. Come see Andrew Lloyd Webber's new musical comedy. And I think it's just, to me, it's like wild that they would even think he's like a funny person. Yeah. Like, I'm like, can we not call it a comedy? Like, this is not funny. I don't think it's funny at all. The reason it's funny is because Carolee Carmelo is pulling every face she has. Like, literally. That's why it's funny. But anyway, so they call it a musical comedy. And then the synopsis from the show website says, In the exceptionally beautiful kingdom of Belleville, Ontario. Just kidding. The fields (laughs) are idyllic. The prince is charming and the townsfolk are ravishing. Only one stubborn peasant stands in the way of absolute perfection, Cinderella. To the flawless residents and royals of Belleville, this damsel is the distress. That's that's it. That sucks. <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's not anything. What is that? <sighs> it's ridiculous. Like, that doesn't make me want to go see your show. No. I think why I'm, I hear that and it, it pisses me off. This show, I, I will say, I think after hearing the audiences in on Broadway, because I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I think audiences in the UK got it more because it was panto. The show was quite panto-y and pantos yeah. are big here. Like, people know... People know when to laugh and know when those cues are. And so there are certain things that just, I don't think, translated over there. So comedy, yep. I don't know. That makes good sense to me. Like the panto versus just like a like some people are doing panto, like in the Broadway production. Because I absolutely agree that panto is how it works. And I think the big problem is, like you said, Jill, only half of them are doing panto on Broadway. And yeah. the, the show's only like half panto. I think it works better. It, the only way it would work is if it went like full panto. Mm-hmm. And we don't even have to, because the advantage of doing something like Cinderella is you don't have, like the story moves itself. Yeah. Everyone knows the story. You don't need to really tell the story. The story will tell itself. So go like, make it all bits. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, let's have some direct address to the audience. Let's have really over the top villains. Once again, yeah. the villains are the only thing that's really working. Let's go even more in that regard, in right. that way. Like, but Cinderella wasn't, like, if you listen to the characters that did the panto, they were written to be panto. So if you look at the other characters and you're like, well, why didn't you go panto? Be like, well, if they would have gone panto, I don't think it would have worked because right. their text didn't, didn't allow them to do, to make those choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It would need to be an overhaul of the book. Exactly. Exactly. To get there. Yeah. yeah. Full on. I also genuinely think one thing I did notice by watching it again this time, it was like, we didn't get, there was just nothing that really happened for the first while of the show because they kept referring back to things. They kept they kept talking about things happening, but nothing actually happened until what was the first thing that actually happened? I mean, she was tied to tree. They went after her, but like I feel like there was a lot of discussions about past things or current things, but mm-hmm. there was just not a lot of things happening and I was just waiting for something to happen. Yeah, in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder about, okay, all I could think about while I was watching it was that it actually doesn't follow the story of Cinderella that closely to the point where I'm like, oh, I actually don't hate the way that you're deviating from this. So why not own that and just call it something else? Like, you can call it a modern retelling of a fairy tale but you don't have to label it as being Cinderella or bad Cinderella. Like, I think you might be able to get away with more of the tongue in cheek thing that works so well in this type of context if you just fully go for it and and separate yourself from the ties that we imagine with Cinderella. I don't that's know. Really a that's no, that's feeling. totally I think that's right on. That makes total sense to me. It's almost I wonder like. I think Bad Cinderella as a title is not a bad choice, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, especially with the, um, you know, we've got a a trend of, like, Peter Pan goes wrong and play that goes wrong and everything is hitting right now. But I think it promises something that the show doesn't deliver. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like, of it actually being, like, a this is, like, it it seems like it's promising a this isn't your mom Cinderella. (laughs) (laughs) You know? And instead, it's kind of a weird, 
<laughs> slow pop opera, Cinderella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I also, I, I mean, I just gotta say this. It's, you, I mean, you, you, okay, you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's, it's not your mom's Cinderella, but then who is it for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not my Cinderella. <laughs> it's not my Cinderella. <laughs> oh, you're right. Who is it for? That is an excellent question because that's where, like, every writer, sorry, every good writer will <laughs> tell you that they write for one person. It's like they pick a very specific human and they write for them. And lo and behold, those stories tend to have the most sort of mass appeal or Universal appeal. Um, yeah. because they're writing f- about a specific human experience, right? And regardless of whether we've had that experience or not, we can maybe understand it, empathize, sympathize, whatever. Yep. This show doesn't actually write with any one person in mind, which is what you're talking about, Nelson. Mm-hmm. And so it's so broad and it's like, well, it's not for the Gen Zs because they're looking at that going, that's not us. And then it's not for millennials because we're like, that's not who we are. <laughs> no, we like good musicals. And yeah. boomers maybe are like tapping their foot, but I don't know. Are, are, like, are they even going to see the show? Like, are they... I can't imagine my parents liking this, honestly. Yeah, I I mean, I know my parents wouldn't like it. A big part of the problem for me, and here, maybe we should do credits real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, Credits on book, music, and lyrics, just so we've done them. Here's who our people are. Music by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Lyrics by David Zippel. Original story and book by Emerald Fennell, who I love. Yeah, absolutely. Book adaptation by Alexis Shear. And music was orchestrated by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Dreadful orchestrations, but that's... No, I guess now was the time to talk about those. I, fuck, I'm not a. I think Android Weber does bad work on this, you guys. Yeah, the lyricist is not much better. And the lyricist, no, David. Well, so uh, to to bring this back to my point, it seems to me a big part of the problem is you have all these like every scene is half in like kind of opera style recit. Yeah. And then it'll kind of just stop, and we'll be in like text for a second, and go back to it. And like in theory, what I'm describing is something that really could could work well in a musical. Works well in a lot of musicals. But it's so clunky here because yeah. the opera recit stuff is so clunky and slow and weird and the show grinds to a halt. Mm-hmm. And then they speak a couple lines and go back into it. And it, I think there's some nice moments in this music where you see shimmers of like, oh, Andrew Lloyd Webber of like his old brilliance. Mm-hmm. But then there's enormous chunks that are just like lead. They yeah. just sit. And it just, it means that none of the scenes ever get moving and everything is so slow. And I would come back from doing three hours of Billy Elliot, which does not feel like three hours. And I try to watch 45 minutes of this and it feels twice as long. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So how do you guys like the music? How do you like the music, Nelson? I mean, I just, as I was listening to it, I feel like he was just stealing all of his old melodies from other shows. Mm-hmm. I just, because I would hear things and I was like, why have I heard this before? It just, everything sounded familiar. And that's the thing, that's what got me because I was just like, what did he actually create in the show that's mm-hmm. new? And I'm sure there are some melodies, but I was constantly thinking in the back of my mind, I'm like, where's this from? Mm-hmm. And because I kept doing that throughout the show, I was like, is this even a melody that he, that he like has saved back from 1997 when he couldn't put it in some other show where he's like, okay, I'm going to throw this in here. Yeah. Um, it just felt a little bit of an afterthought again some melodies were beautiful i loved uh lonely me only yep. me the um, the princess song i mean that was like mm-hmm. a beautiful great song yep. and there is some great music but the genres that we're hitting are vast oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah like it, it it just felt like we were in like pop rock opera and then a bit of contemporary musical theater or american yep. sounding yeah. and then we're just in and because it was so shifty I was just like, I don't know where we are. Like, I don't know what, m- like, my ears mm-hmm. need time to adjust. Yeah. And they just couldn't adjust. Totally. Yeah, where, where's your head at, Jill? Uh, so, yeah. Bad Cinderella is fully a ripoff of In My Own Little Corner. I was going to say, what a, bo- what a bold choice. So bold. It's, it literally, I think there's like four notes that are different in that phrase. Rhythmically, it's got the that. exact same rhythm, rhythmic vocabulary. Yeah. Identical. So, that... And then he rips off 10 minutes ago in the ballroom sequence. He does whatever his version, his discount version of that is. And I'm like, ugh, anyway. So there's those two that really This is a big problem with Sir Andrew Lloyd as well, frankly. Yeah. 
And like Nelson was saying, in terms of style, it wasn't cohesive. So I'm not sitting there knowing I'm listening to a, oh, this is supposed to be more of a classic Mm -hmm. musical. No, uh, this is supposed to be a pop one. It's like, no, there was like GNS moments. There was like just a lot of random musical choices, of course, totally unsupported by the lyrics, which were absolute trash. Absolute trash. I just... Like, so they were so bad. Like, there was no point to anything. We always did one too many verses. Like, just everything was just wrong. Yeah. That, I think, is my main qualm with the show in general is the music and lyrics, I think. Well, 100%. I feel the exact same way. Because I can maybe justify... Yeah, I can justify the story, uh-huh. the book even. I can see, like, merits in the way that it was structured. But yeah, no. Music and lyrics, I just can't get past... I 100% agree. That's the that's the big sickness on this show. Mm-hmm. That's what's dragging it down for sure in a, in the most significant way. And I just I think it gets overlooked as well. But I think it's a big problem that Andrew Lloyd Webber insists on doing his own arranging and orchestrations as well at this point in his career. I think you listen to it and there's no question the the orchestrations are bad. Mm-hmm. They're just not of the level that people are orchestrating on Broadway these days. Yeah. And we've got some true. brilliant orchestration going on on Broadway and it's just cheap sounding and flat. The big solo Bad Cinderella, like the, the song Bad Cinderella, is in a unforgiving place yes. for a uh, mezzo's voice. And there is no effort made to put any safeguards in place. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just a solo exposed voice, no backup box. <laughs> like, why you wouldn't put in on this? Because it's got this enormous key change. And it's a nice key change, actually. Like, that, that's one moment, the yeah. key change in the Bad Cinderella song. I'm like, hello. And she's getting lifted when she's that doing that. And I was like, so that girl has to pull all of that support from her yeah. core. Because I was like, she's not getting support from the ground because people are holding that her. That's wild. And why on earth you would not put some oohs and ahs behind there so she can like float it and save it for the last note? Yeah. Like, because yeah. you're going to have to do this eight times a week. And oh in general, God. that's a specific example that kind of seems to illustrate the wider. This show sounds really hard to say. Yeah, it's a it's jumpy. Yeah. And, like, always in weird places in everyone's voice. <laughs> you know what I mean? The amount of times. Well, even, like, I tried figuring out the time signature that the stepsisters, what time signature their little song, their duet was. Because they're not in a, um, oh, what's it called? An equal yeah, meter right. time. Like a duple meter. They're in some sort of, like, 7-8 or 11-8 or something. And I was trying to figure out, I was trying to tap it out and I couldn't figure it out. And I was thinking in my mind, I'm like, did it have to be this complex? And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I'm like, imagine the girl who has to understudy both of these roles and just has to know both of them. This is like some um, uh, from Into the Woods. It's not my fault. It's my fault. I just gave him those games. (laughs) But also for no reason, right? For no reason. (laughs) Because they're supposed to be these idiots, right? It's like they wouldn't, they wouldn't sing like that. They can barely string two sentences together. So why are we overcomplicating their music? Like, it just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and it just means they don't have a voice in the show all of a sudden. Right. Mm-hmm. And they certainly can't ever be, like, I don't, they, to bring it back, let this be a panto. I don't want the stepsisters to sing at all. Or else yeah. they do, like, a funny character song and then have, like, five minutes of crowd. Totally. You know, like, yep. geez. So what are we giving the book, music, and lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> tens, 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 yeah. Tens across, tens across the board. The board. <laughs> <laughs> so the New York Times uh, review written by Jesse Green says simply bring earplugs. <laughs> and then it said bring eye plugs. And then did it and also say it bring said, soul plugs? <laughs> soul plugs. Soul plugs. <laughs> yes. Yes. So... Oh, that's so funny. So the earplugs thing oh, obviously oh. makes sense with this section we're talking about. Eye plugs to come, soul plugs also are sort of part of this yeah. section. Yeah, no mincing of words there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, American, the American reviewers tore the show apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They really did. They stuck the knife in and they turned. Yeah. And I f- the British reviewers were a lot more kind because... And this could be for like a multiple of reasons. I think it's because this is, this was like one of the first big shows to open post pandemic. Right. And they wanted to find success. Yep. But they wanted to have like, bring it back. We're like, let's, let's keep positivity. Let's new show. Um, let's let people go see it and stuff like that. So they gave it pretty decent reviews. Mm-hmm. 
And I remember reading, like, I didn't read the reviews until after I'd gone to see it. Yeah. I had uh, I had heard from people, like, I had heard personal opinions prior to that, but I, I, I didn't read any reviews. And then I saw the show, and I read some reviews, and I was like, really? Like, are we not, are we not going to talk about, like, the bad things? Yes. Are we just going to be like, oh, like, it's... Um, it's a beautiful show, like using very um, vague wording mm. or just pointing out the things that you can go and find joy in. But I, it just felt like, whew, why why was this ignored? Um, and then somehow it was a good idea to bring it across the pond because they thought, oh, yeah, it's get, the, the New York audiences, they're going to get it. Right. Well, maybe we should talk about the... The kind of semi-conspiracy theory around this show and why it even came to New York Ooh, tell was me. because Phantom posted closing and Angela Weber needed something to continue his Broadway streak until they can reopen New Phantom. And so they were hoping that Bad Cinderella would like live for a year or something oh. so that um, Angela Weber would continue his uninterrupted, what is it, 30? 43 years. 43 years with it's a show on Broadway. 43 years! <laughs> <laughs> Which is always makes a lot of sense to me because there's, like, this show definitely shouldn't be in New York. Like, I mean, there's the proof is in the pudding. It was working better in the UK, at least. Yeah. Um, And playing to the audience. I mean, that, that's great. Like, I uh, ex- absolutely accept cultural differences can be in play here, but... Well, we have seen this happen time and again, right? Where there is a specific show that is working for a UK audience. And even if it's not like amazing, there's still something that's connecting or resonating. I think about chess, like that was a mm-hmm. huge hit there. Chess is a Rocky big Horror, example. Rocky yeah. Horror. American Psycho. American Psycho. American like Psycho. all of these where for whatever reason, that initial presentation which resonates with that audience. And then they're like, oh, you know what? Let's take it to New York. And then they do this thing where they change a bunch of stuff to suit the American audience or whatever. And then it fails. And it's like, why didn't you just trust that we would like it? Like, why are we having to make those changes? Like, I'm always curious about what the discussions are surrounding what needs modification or if you think it's if you're acknowledging the show might not translate just let it not translate just don't bring let it, it live in the uk great yeah yeah That's like i'll come see it live, there you know? or whatever yeah. like i but i also don't think that american and british audiences are the same well they're no, not Absolutely certainly they're not. not i mean i don't want to put any um like i don't want to generalize when this show closed on the west end and it closed because it wasn't doing well in the box office Mm-hmm. I just don't understand how producers, whether they're British or American or wherever was producing this, who eventually was going to produce this on Broadway, could think, well, you know what? It's just the wrong audience. When we're going to bring it over here, this is where it's going to where it's going to work. I just don't understand. And this is just one of those points where it's like no one's saying no. Yes. Someone just has to say no. Yeah. The problem is Andrew Lloyd Webber has too much money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he can, he has enough money to self-finance it, and no one can, no one has to say no because there's no other money in the room. Oh, God. There doesn't need to be. That's such a frightening concept. I know, right? Hey? So the other thing I want to mention, because we've kind of been talking a little bit about, like, the context of the show as well as the book, music, and lyrics, but I, I did want to name that Andrew Lloyd Webber's son, Nicholas, passed away, like, two days before opening. And I was, really I was young. actually really surprised that there wasn't some sort of collective discussion surrounding opening reviews. Like I was a little bit like, can we wait a week? Like, do do we have to do we have to do this now? Like, just because that's how we've always done it. Like, I just I wondered about the sympathy there. I wondered if they could have maybe reviewed it in preview. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, was there not a way around this that could have been just a little more sensitive? That's not slamming this guy's show. Right when his son has died. Yeah. The only thing is, the no, the reason why I think some people can't take criticism is because they can't separate the artist from the person. Yeah, uh-huh. fair. And so slamming his show has nothing to do with him personally. Yes. Unless, I mean, you can, I mean, yeah. you can make it quite personal mm. with the way you phrase stuff. But again, you can hate Andrew Lloyd Webber and not hate him as a human being. Yeah. And so 
while I agree that there should have been maybe, uh, but then like, then it's, that's all the criti- uh, critics being like, okay, are we all going to collectively agree that we're going to do this? Right. But then why did they just postpone opening? Like it could have been like a whole. Yes. Which they had asked, like, are we going to postpone opening? Like, should we do that? I remember reading that Andrew Lloyd Webber said no, but I think he just decided not to be there. So maybe there was enough separation like between him and opening night that it didn't maybe feel so personal afterward. Because I don't know, like if you're not there, what's it to you? There is a little bit of that. There is like, yeah, it's his show and like Andrew Lloyd Webber invites that kind of discourse around him. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, there's a lot of people involved in any given show, you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, interesting all around. Just so much yeah. going on. Up till that point, if we're talking about context, Andrew Lloyd Webber had not exactly been a cool, chill dude in the <laughs> press about Cinderella, Bad Cinderella right. up to this point, you know what I mean? Yeah. He'd had yeah, a few yeah, instances yeah. of, frankly, kind of being a real dick about his company. Right. Minimizing that work. Yeah, minimizing their work and their effort, which is really not a cool thing to do. Yep. There was the reviewer, the American reviewer who came over and saw the British version and panned it. And then apparently, like, Lloyd, Mr. Lloyd Webber. <laughs> oh, Andrew yeah, Lloyd sir. Webber. That's right. Um, yeah. we, we, we haven't been calling him sir. We are. I think I, call, I called him Sir Andy Lloyd at some point. <laughs> <laughs> he was in his, like, Spanish house or whatever in Spain, whatever. And he, and he contacted the cast saying how, like, bad or disappointed or something he was that this show was, like, um, got this horrible review. And I think that's when there was, like, a change in mood from the cast. I can see why. And there was, um, I mean, it was rumored that um, there was a full new cast that was set up to go and start rehearsals to start the show Keep Going before um, they posted closing. So the plan was to keep it going. So they were going to, like... Take the West End cast, put in the New York, and put in a new West End cast to keep it running. No, I don't. I don't think there was ever a plan to actually bring the West End. Or cast so, or to so, New York. so, or so it was going to be like they would continue running on the West End, and they were already rehearsing a new Broadway cast, or already getting it ready. Yeah. Well, well West right. End. so basically, uh, on the West End, like cast just full changeover. Mm. So basically, sure. like some people, some uh, current cast members will stay with the show, and then some will leave. And so, um, and from what I heard is like because the. Po- the closing came out on Sunday. And this is the whole drama. This is the whole drama that happened with the show when yep. they posted closing. The posting came out on Sunday and apparently a half an hour before the posting was announced, an email went out to all the agents of the actors. And it was going to say, we're going to post closing. But agents don't work on weekends. So none of the actors heard this. So this post came out on um, in the media. Oh my and then God. all the actors working on the show found out that it was ending. And then all the actors that had signed contracts to go into rehearsals that was going to be starting in like a week or two weeks or whatever, found out that they were, they didn't, they weren't going to have a job anymore. Oh my God. That's the most brutal way to find out. That is it's so a, brutal. Yeah. Not that also, just in general, like, have the decency to tell your cast a little bit in advance. Yes. Like, these are people's jobs, for God's sake. Yeah. So, if we had to, if we had to give a rating to this book, Music and Lyrics, out of 10 playbills... <laughs> I'm happy to do it all together. Yeah. Yeah. Three. Mm-hmm. I'm going th- three, three. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I was going to give it 3.5, but I think I just, I, there's no 0.5s here. I'm giving three and I can't give a four. So I'm giving a three. Okay. Yeah. I was going to give a four. I'm sorry. No, take a four. No, it's take okay. Don't four. apologize. Great. Joe likes it's you like this more than us. Personal opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. Everyone has I a liked it. Everyone has an opinion. <laughs> I wish I could have seen the untouched emerald fennel book. Yes. Because I think I think I would have at least connected even more. Like, you know what I mean? Emerald fennel's fucking cool. I want to see Emerald Fennel Cinderella. Yeah. Um fucking Did you ever see uh Promising Young Woman, Nelson? Oh, did I? Is that what it's called? No. Oh, yeah, yes. I, know. I didn't. Oh, it really <gasps> doing is this something it, I need to see? Yes. It's heroin. It's a heroin movie, but it's it's good. Ooh. Yeah. Watch it. It is. Yeah. Okay. Just Promising kiss. Young Woman. Yeah, that's a uh, Emerald Fennel's movie. So good. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Academy Award. There we go. Emerald mm-hmm. Fennel. Academy yep. Award. Sir Fennel. Emerald Fennel to you. Sir Emerald. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> nice. I'm glad we spent a lot of time on that. Yeah, me too. Because honestly, the rest of these categories, at least for me, are kind of going to be fun. So let's get into direction and choreo. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> 
directed by Lawrence Connor. Musical direction by Kristen Blodgett. And choreographed by Joanne M. Hunter, who I believe we've talked about before. Disaster, we talked about Joanne M. Hunter. Oh, with- no. Yeah. <laughs> Disaster. Disaster. Likewise, shout out to um, Kristen Blagette, um for being a uh, woman music director and music supervisor in the industry, um, especially yeah. for Lloyd Webber. That's something that's unfortunately still very rare and frankly shouldn't be. And she's a badass. Yep. And it's also it's very fascinating to look at her credits. Like, a lot of company players here, a lot of people who have done a lot of work on Weber shows before. Like, she'd been, like, conducting on um, on the, the Cats in 2016. She started as, like, an associate on Phantom. And, like, so she's been through, like, the Lloyd Weber machine. Mm-hmm. And is now, like, a high-ranking music professional in the Lloyd Weber machine, which is a cool place to be. Nelson, do you have any initial thoughts on the direction or choreo? Yeah. They were working with the material that they got. Oh, yeah. I don't know how much in the original, I'm mean, like when this was like West End when it first started working there. I'm curious how much say they had in the room as to creation or deletion of material that they were given. And I'd be curious to know that. I didn't love all the direction. The choreo was really not bad. The, the sexy man lift weighting, weight lifting thing. I was as as a homosexual. I was all for it. But in my mind, I was like, children are watching. <laughs> <laughs> but as, as someone who likes big, who likes big muscles, you were like, oh, as oh, a man oh. who likes a good muscle, <laughs> I mean, I was all for it. But yeah, I just, I, cause I really wanted to like, I really wanted to keep my eye out for choreography specifically. Cause I wanted to be, as I was watching someone to be like, okay, what were the choices that she made? Like what the little things, you know? Yep. And, and I really did like that. The direction, I feel like he was held back because of the book. I feel like he was trying to make the book work as best as he can. And when it didn't work, I feel like it'd be easy to say, ah, you're bad at your job. But really, he was like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I tried. 100%. You can be at the mercy of that book. Do you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And the sets. Like, you, there's Uh so many direction things that are informed by the space you're working in, too, right? And so I can see exactly what you're talking about. Totally. And also Lloyd Webber, who's also a producer on this and is pretty notorious for getting his fingers in everyone's business. You know, like, I'm sure there was all sorts of bullshit notes that he had to implement at various points. Yeah. Mm. Um, Why don't I like this choreo, Jill? I feel like over the course of this podcast, we've been able to see me develop a taste in choreo. Yeah. More than I had before. Mm -hmm. And we just got done with Wild Party where I loved the choreo. Yeah. I'll tell you why. But you, you, well, you sounded like you had a... Okay, so it seems seems like they're, they're moving too much and... I don't know, it doesn't seem graceful, it seems athletic, and it tired me out to watch it. Yeah, I feel like you probably didn't like the choreography because she didn't. Joanna M. Hunter, I don't think, does the contemporary movement thing very well. Yeah, okay. I think she does that classic, like the ballroom sequence. I was like, yeah. that's gorgeous. Oh, I, liked, I really liked that it. That was stunning. I really that liked it. That was stunning. Beautiful formations and it's spinning. unique and swirling yeah. and whirling and that's a great beautiful point. I lifts. That. Like, yep. that was gorgeous. And then you look at the contemporary thing and you're like, oh, this is like late 90s contemporary, but this isn't like current. And so I at least... From my eye, I felt a little bit like some of the traps of what we're, if we're not like still taking class or like involving ourselves with like how dance is evolving, I I think it's easy to just be like, oh, I'll do the thing that I feel comfortable with. And maybe that for Joanne M. Hunter, that's like more of a 90s take on the movement. And at times it just wasn't as um, exciting as some of the other stuff we're currently seeing. And I think that's probably, Mm. at least for me, that's where the problem was. In every regard, there is nothing contemporary about this show. (laughs) You know what I mean? Nothing about, for a show that was written and has had its life in the past few years, nothing about this show felt of this, these past few years, you know? The, the the gays oh, no. in the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually okay. true. Yeah, yeah, fair. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I suppose I was more referring to like the the broad, um, yeah, I guess, the broad yeah. strokes. Yeah, but no, I, I absolutely dig that. And like, I would have been. Thank you for that, Jill. That really that helps a lot. That you're absolutely right. I really loved the um, the ball. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't if I think about what if this choreo was in fucking American Psycho, or I'm having trouble thinking of something like a yeah. '90s a, a musicals 
that is of the 90s now. Yes. I'd be okay with it. Like, I'd be happy. It just didn't seem like it was working with everything else. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But I did, I agree with Nelson. I love seeing the dudes dancing. Yeah. I too love a muscle. Yeah. Just one. <laughs> one. Nice to, lo- it's, not, it's nice to like a one. Muscle. Only one. Yeah. I need one bicep. <laughs> If we had to pass, if we had to pass judgment on the direction in choreo, if we had to rate it out of say ten playbills, how many monkeys would we give it? I'll give it a seven. I was the same. Yeah, exactly you're the, the same. same. Seven. Yeah. Oh, I'm a five. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, okay. I'm lower. All right. Direction was fine. Choreo was fine. I just, yeah, something about the choreo really didn't stick with, didn't sit well with me, and I wasn't digging it. Yeah. I wonder if if you'd been there in person, and again, we sometimes think about it like that, right? Like. Picture yourself in the space. Jill, if I'd been there in person, I probably would have had a couple drinks in me and I'd be having a grand old time. I know. <laughs> and that's the thing. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'd see Bad Cinderella with the two of you. <sighs> Absolutely. And a couple drinks. Why not? I'd do it again. <laughs> with the right people. I would do it only with the drinks. Let's talk about the design. Scenic design and costume design by Gabriella Tylasova. Lighting design by Bruno Poet. Sound design by Gareth Owen, hair and wig design by Luke Verasheren, and moving light programmer was Brad Gray. I think the set is cool. Mm. I like the set. All all aspects of it? Like no. even the moving pieces that come in? Okay. I really liked the pop-up book at the beginning. Yep. I thought that was really clever. Everything's on a revolve and um, it kind of looks at, like each section of the revolve looks like a different piece of a pop-up book and it looks really nice. My issue with the set, and maybe with the designs in general, and maybe it's similar to my issue with the choreo, is just all too much. And mm-hmm. it's like maybe a little garish? Like... Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think that maybe they were just trying to, like, distract you? That being like, oh, look at all these cool, pretty things. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Probably. Yeah. I mean, I like the design. I thought it was cool. I mean, I'm thinking of, again, the opening number, which when they had that turntable yep. going and they had things coming on and coming mm-hmm. off and you could, um, I mean, depending on your perspective, like depending on where you're sitting, it really looked like things were kind of coming out of nowhere. Great. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really cool. And that was very clever. And was it two turntables or was it just one? Was there like one in a one? I couldn't tell if it was the center piece also revolved. I couldn't tell. I think it does. I think there's like, it's okay. like a, it's one revolve with two pieces. Yeah. Oh, okay. What do you think of the design, Jill? Um, I really like the opening design aspects. I think I struggled with the ensemble costuming. You didn't like the colorful? You know what it reminded me of? You know about like 15 years ago when the cool thing was to dress sexy for Halloween? It (laughs) kind of reminded me of what you'd like buy in a bag at party stuff. Like the Snow White (laughs) at party stuff. Or like Sleeping Beauty at party stuff. That's really interesting. Was that the thing 15 years ago? Or is that just when we were in our late teens, early 20s? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean is it still happening? Are people still dressed sexy I don't, for Halloween? I don't get invited to those parties. I don't know. I, Probably. I, they sound exhausting. They sound, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that was like, I was not thrilled with that choice. But overall, I actually liked a lot about the design. And I think I would have liked it even more in person. Mm-hmm. Like, I think I would have really appreciated having those things. But you're right. I think it was a bit of like a look over here. <laughs> yeah, one <laughs> Don't look listen there. to what's yeah. happening. Yeah. <laughs> I also have to say, like, uh, the the part of the design that really sticks out in my head is like the ballroom scene mm-hmm. yeah. was beautiful. Like, yeah. it was stunning. Yeah. And then the dresses that their girls were in, so that every time they kicked their leg, this yes. dress would float up with their the leg. Tool. And then s- the Ugh. tool would just, and slowly come down yeah, the as they were, like, moving. Like, the motion. Gorgeous. And it made me think two things. I was like, I wonder how heavy that tool is, that that girl mm-hmm. can bring her leg all the way to her head. Like, <laughs> yep. the musculature that would be required to, like, do that. I'm just thinking, I'm like, what a stunning image. Especially yep. when all the girls did it in, like, synchronized. Yes. It was just, it was beautiful. Yep. And I watched that and I was like, and then she came out and then Cinderella came out in her dress. Mm-hmm. And I think her dress was, was also really beautiful. That was nice for once they had fleshed it out during intermission. Like once they put the skirt on it, I was like, oh, that's better. I think the quick change, I was like, oh, this is frozen. Like it literally did look like Elsa to me. Did anyone else think it was a missed opportunity to not have her change 
in the interval, and so they could have done more. To not to not do the no, magic to, switching like, at all. Basically, to not have the reveal at the end of Act 1, to actually have her go in to do her plastic surgery, and then oh. be like, end of Act 1. And then we're surprised later. And then in Act 2, you are surprised when you oh. see her for the first time. I was like, why did no one think of this? You could have had like a full intermission where you could have like beautified her. Maybe you could on, put on like... um like a fake nose or something or like uh, paint her lips bigger, like actually make her look a little bit more like plastic surgery if that's what you want to go for. And I was like, what? Yeah. In context, she gets a different wig and that's it. And everyone's like, she's pretty now. And it's like, okay. Or did she just go to the salon? Like, what are we doing? Because like one of the opportunities doing a production of Cinderella offers you is to do a little bit of theater magic with the magic change. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, that's what the Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella does really cool. The production that we did was, that was one of the best parts of it, was how exciting those magic quick changes were. And there were. was two! Mm-hmm. And both of them were great! That magic quick change is no good. Like, it's not very exciting. So why, I agree, Nelson, why not just bail on it? Either actually, like, do a cool one, where you, like, have a real cool underdressing situation, or uh, uh, magic pouches, or fucking whatever, to do the quick change. Or, fuck it, don't worry about it. And you can just take advantage of the fact that you have time and do yeah, a nice big yeah. change. I do like that right? idea. It's like they did the worst of both worlds. <laughs> they half half did both things. Yeah, and that, and it's not good. So what are we giving this design? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I didn't like it. But. I will say also, I, I liked the Cinderella's look on the West End more than I liked it on Broadway. Cinderella was specifically more gothy yeah. in the West End version. Which I thought was like a cool attempt to being like making her bad. Right. As opposed to in the Broadway version where she wasn't, was she kind of, she going for steampunk? I just don't know what she was going for. (laughs) She looked like a member of the band Bewitched. Do you remember that band? Yeah, absolutely. They're like Irish or Scottish or something. And uh, maybe this is going back, but I'm just like, what makes her bad? Yeah. If she's supposed to be bad, is she supposed to be ugly? Because everyone's saying that she's ugly. I'm like, girl's not ugly. So it's not that. And she's bad. Oh, she spray painted something. Oh, that's, that's. So she's a troublemaker. Yeah. She's a troublemaker. But I just feel like she's angsty. Not really, though. Yeah. And angsty is not bad. It's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. So you're watching someone who you don't really like. You have to feel something for Cinderella. You have to get her on your side. Or she has to be on the audience's side. And I just don't know if there's anything that happens that gets the audience on her side. I agree with that completely. Let's give a rating and then we can get into the performances and maybe talk a little bit more about um, the character arcs and what the actors bring to it. Kind of dive into that kind of final piece of the puzzle with a little more nuance. Yeah. Designs. Uh, six? Yeah, I would do Five. a six. Six. Five. I was going to go seven again. Great. But yeah. Now you're making me second guess myself. No, take just take your seven. Take it. It's so tough on a production that involves kind of an egomaniac who I don't like as much as I don't like Andrew Lloyd Webber mm-hmm. and don't care for him. It's hard to fault other departments because I'm just like, this frustrating dude was walking around being an asshole, I'm sure. Good for you for getting it done. Yeah, actually. Which is a perfect segue to the performances. <laughs> wonderful beautiful angels who had to go up eight shows a week and hit this show oh god did they ever they okay did they gave ever. it their motherfucking all absolutely yes. and i will like i will say with the material that they're given with the keys that they had to sing shit in with the time signatures that those stepsisters had to deal with and those understudies who also had to deal with it as well yeah, yeah. like i am i am just saying that they gave it mm-hmm. and oh, yeah. people shat on the show and people uh, some people shat on them and i will say again i didn't like all the performances mm-hmm. no. i really generally think i think cinderella was miscast i think yes. they could have gone with someone else I agree. not that i think that she did a bad job i just wish that they would have gone with someone um a better actor you can say it a better actor yep. yeah they could have mm-hmm. come with a better actor even i'm got again no shade but i also didn't like that the prince's acting choices yeah he just kind of like Sometimes I just wanted to like grab him and be like, and plant him and be like, just stay planted. 
Just have your feet. Stop don't walk. Me. You don't have to walk. You don't. You don't have to move on every line. I feel like it was. Uh, I feel like I was just uh, sitting there as an acting coach and being like, "You can only move on the line, or you can't move at all." And I'm just like, and I just don't understand. And I just didn't know if he was like not use like comfortable in his body. But then he did that dance thing where yeah. he just like freaking did a, an aerial, and I was like, "Hey, dude can dance. Dude knows his body." So then I'm wondering what's going yeah. on with. Then does it become a direction thing? Is that how he was directed? I don't know. So that was, right. that's, that's the vet on that. At one point um, during our watching, Paul turned to me and was like, who is this guy? And I was like, looking at I- IBDB and I was like, that's Jordan, Do- his name is Jordan Dobson. And he was like, no, no. Is he like, like is he stunt casting? Is he like an influencer? Is he, right. why, why is he on this show? <laughs> Because he's got to be famous, right? Otherwise, why is he on this show? And, and that was like, right no, off the Paul. top. And as I listened more, I was like, oh, you may not actually be a bad singer. Yeah. Like, I think a big a big part of this is the songwriting and the keys and the lack of support from the arranging team. Yeah. So why don't we start with someone that I think we can all agree did, mostly did the thing. which Carly Carmelo. Carmelo. Slayed it. We must Superstar. acknowledge by far the best in this show. Yeah. By far. I mean, the role was written well, and it allowed Carolee to, like, just go in. Yeah, And she did. Yep. She owned it. And I love seeing her in that way. Like, we don't actually really get to see her like that very often. Like, she plays this, uh, she tends to play characters that are maybe softer, is the word? I don't know. But this had something that I'm just not used to seeing from her and I was very excited. She's just a, she's a pro. She understands the assignment. She understood what the role was, understood how big to go to make it work. Because when she's on, that's when it feels most like a panto. You're exactly right. And same with the queen, Grace McLean. Yep. Like they live in the same world. I buy it. I'm yeah. I'm into it. Um, I will say that I do feel bad for Carolee Carmelo for being in consistent flops. Over and over again. <laughs> right, we've talked about like, her all a the time. Bad run. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so Lenady Ganau, who played Cinderella. Yeah. I think sang it really well, like navigated all of those really difficult placements beautifully. Mm-hmm. Nice pop focused sound. Yeah. But I thought as an actor, I was so bored by her choices and it. And again, goes back to what makes her bad. Her choices maybe weren't as strong. And then maybe the director was kind of like, oh, that's good enough. You know, like, I, yeah. I'm not sure wh- <laughs> where one begins and or one ends and the other begins. But I was not as uh, excited by her acting choices. But vocally, I, I thought she was wonderful. Yeah, like, I, I agree. You know, it's that it's that funny thing where. Because it's such a hard, weird singing we- and a weird key. Like, you could hear the navigation. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. But, the, but there's, there's nothing wrong with that either, necessarily. It's just, and it was kind of this moment of like, oh, I can hear yeah. that. But, you know, I, like, I don't fault it. Like, it's, all the choices are good. And you got to navigate it somehow. You know what I mean? Not, and not all of us can be Carolee Carmelo where it feels effortless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wish, like, her big solo that the bad, that bad Cinderella had a bunch of backup Vox. So she wasn't just, she just felt left left sailing out at sea. You know what I mean? In those moments. I guess all of her songs were unsupported. All of them. Because she sang like four freaking solos. Like... Mm. And like, this is not fucking Parade. This is not Les Mis. Like, let's (laughs) pull out some stops to like, make this doable eight shows a week. This show only works if everyone's healthy and happy and having fun. Including the audience. Exactly. Okay, the other... Um, artist I wanted to call attention to yes. was the godmother, Christina Acosta Robinson. Yeah. I really, really loved her delivery of a less good material. And I actually was sad she wasn't around more, like as a character actor. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But, uh, like if there, if there was any way to, I like the Prince Charming thing at the end for, mm-hmm. um, you know, representing, um, like a gay person on um, on stage and that rules. Yeah. And, but I, I didn't like it for, like, narratively. It's just, it's so long yeah. and it's just yeah. this person we've never seen before, this character we've never seen before. <laughs> You're sure we couldn't have done something with the fairy godmother plastic surgeon in there right. instead? Like, yes. you know? It's someone we've already seen. I mean, it's also crazy because if you think at, like, Broadway rates and how much they're paying these actors to be there, <laughs> Literally. to be backstage and to not be utilizing them more. Yeah. 
I mean, just give her, like, maybe the godmother also delivers mail. And she comes in and she's like, oh, I'm in the scene now. And then she walks away. I don't know. Like, maybe the godmother sings a bunch of backing vocals during Bad Cinderella. Right. Maybe we just get some ooze from her. Get some ooze and Oz in, for God's sake. (laughs) (laughs) Some alto ooze in the background. We love it. And that's all we we need. And then she can float a little bit during the Sunday matinees and life is grand. I like that. We have to we have to acknowledge that ensemble though too. Oh. They worked so hard in their party stuff outfits. Oh Absolutely. my god. They were <laughs> trying. They were going for it. This whole show where all the um all the dude ensemble members like it it takes a lot of work to be that ripped all the time. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Like that's like it's pretty physically uncomfortable actually to have your muscle to be to live in the state. Nelson, you know it. Like this as any, and any performer, any dude performer it's knows. Just, it's, it's, it's a full commitment right. and it becomes your life. That's a That's thing. not a small thing And of ask, course, yeah. a show becomes your life. A show becomes your life. But the thing is, though, to maintain... And some, you know, some people are just like gym people in general yep. uh-huh. but it's not only the gym it's also everything you eat I was right. say. so that's the thing it's they are um they are machines in what they have to do in order to mean not only maintain the body that they have but also like vocally and physically and everything else that goes behind it mm-hmm. so it's just yeah. it's it's a lot i don't so think much. we can understate what an ask that is on those members of the ensemble oh, and i think absolutely. we should as an industry maybe interrogate whether it's fair to make that ask. Or that necessary. Level. Or necessary, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, like, I was really hoping, like, the one thing that I did kind of like in the West End version is you had Carrie Hope Fletcher in there, who is not, um, she's not a size two. I agree. That's nice. <laughs> An element of body diversity in the cast, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I was just, I was hoping for some sort of body diversity, and they're just, I mean, of course, I understand why there isn't, because they're trying to paint this beautiful city, and so, and they're trying to um, make a point, but it's just, I don't know, I mean, maybe there just isn't a way to do it in this show. Well, but, there has yeah. to, there absolutely is a way to do it in the show, Like because I can see the point they're trying to make, and there's ways to make it way better, because as it stands, the point, it doesn't, they don't even come close to making any sort of point about... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah physical appearance or the importance of inner yeah. beauty or whatever. I agree. There's no acknowledgement of that being, of those standards being wrong. <laughs> like yeah, none. 100%. <laughs> uh, that was the other thing that kind of pissed me off. It's like, we get into act two, she's in the ball, she's she's all like plasticky, mm-hmm. she's all like been surgeried up, and then she pulls off her wig and she's like, you didn't recognize me because now I'm beautiful and I'm blaming you for blame for not recognizing me because I got plastic surgery and you should have known it was me the whole time, but you didn't. And so I'm going to run off now and be all angsty because so I'm angsty, petty. Cinderella. But those actors, they're trying. They're really doing it. They are oh, trying. God. Okay. Is it time for the Tonys? I think so. We can, we can say without, without question, performances, 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Good for them for working their asses yeah. off. Oh, Good yeah. For, them for eating, yeah, eating yeah. nothing but broccoli and chicken. I hope their Sunday closing show has just the most decadent food. I hope it is the only McDonald's cheeseburgers. Just burgers, burgers. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> <sighs> okay, so the Tonys are different for this show because they haven't happened yet. In fact, the whole the whole reason we're doing this show is because Noms just got announced and Cinderella, Bad Cinderella got shut out. It completely did. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. Mm-hmm. What do you think deserved an on though? Carolee Carmelo. Yeah, I'd give an on to Carolee in Best Supporting, obviously. And that's about it, probably. I mean, maybe the sets. Yeah, I was going to say maybe design. Yeah. In general, it's kind of a wild Tony's this year, you guys. Okay, so what do we have nominated? Oh, New York, New York. Yeah. Some Like It Hot? Question mark. Yeah, some like it hot's in Best New. So Best New Musical is Anne Juliet. Is Corn? Kimberly oh, Akimbo. New York, New York. <laughs> shucked. And some like corn. it hot. <laughs> corn. Corn? Ah, corn. <laughs> I was like, I know Corn is one oh, of them. No. <laughs> You're right. It kind of is. What's going to take Best New Musical, you guys? Well, I don't okay, think it's going to be Corn. No. <laughs> but everyone's saying that it might be Shucked. But, okay, but Kimberly Akimbo is definitely like that sort of underdog show. I think it's going to be Kimberly Akimbo, personally. That, like, that were, that's where I would put my money, at least. I actually haven't even checked out Kimberly Akimbo that much, but... It's an intriguing story to me. Yeah, totally. I, like, I like the idea of it. I feel like Anne Juliet's challenging for me because it's not um, original music. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't I don't think Anne Juliet's gonna take it. No, and like Shucked, it would be like an Avenue Q type thing, but I don't think it well, I think Shucked is fun, I don't think it has the power of Avenue Q to do an upset. Oh yeah, fair. And like New York, New York, don't know much. Some like it hot, don't know much. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Interesting. I'll do some more I'll do some more research before we hit it. Before it happens. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so when you when everyone listens to this, this will all be old news. So we'll be we'll be judged. <gasps> I will Cut in my own personal insert, <laughs> yeah. being like, and we were wrong about the following things. Hello, everyone. This is producer Daphne here, chiming in with uh, the post-Tony's Muggies and Playbells spicy hot takes, including what we were wrong about and what we were totally right about. So, first of all, despite not knowing anything about Kimberly Akimbo, it took Best Musical... Uh, it took Best Score, which is amazing, and Paul, a giant Janine Tesori San, was just pumping his fist, cheering the entire time. Um, we also saw some wonderful celebration of bigger bodies on stage, which is just something really important to us, and we also saw the first two non-binary actors to uh, win Tonys, which is amazing, uh, Alex Newell for Shucked, and Jay Harrison Gee as uh, Jerry slash Daphne. Hey, that's me. In Some Like It Hot. Uh, and also, best revival of a musical was Parade. So glad that our, you know, original <laughs> season's underdog finally got a great re- revival in everyone's favorite 40-year-old teenager, Ben Platt. And also sending a lot of love to the cast of Sweeney Todd and Into the Woods and Camelot. All wonderful revivals. It was a really incredible night, especially considering that Ariana DeBoss had to do all of her work sans writers, uh, all the love in the world to the WGA in their fight for um, union rights. And yeah, for now we're going to get back to the show. The, the actual really interesting category to me right now is Best Musical Revival and whether Parade or Sweeney Todd is going to take it. Ooh, interesting. I, oh, God. <gasps> Isn't that interesting? So it's Camelot, oh, Into the geez. Woods, Parade, Sweeney Todd. Okay, Into the Woods won too many things. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be Into the Sorry. Woods. Sorry. Like, yeah, I, you're fine. It's, it's, it was okay. <laughs> also, uh, two shows that we will end up covering at some point on this podcast are nominated for Best Original Score, including Almost Famous and K-Pop. Oh, That's yeah, right. we both do both of those at some point. Yep. Mm-hmm. I didn't know Almost Famous got a nom. I thought, I knew K-Pop did, but I didn't know yep. what Almost Famous did. Is Almost Famous Tom Kitt? Yes. Yes. That makes sense. Sondheim has two revivals. Oh, God. As, so much to uh, unpack. For, wow, and then last year, he won for Company. Yes. And apparently the Sweeney revival's really nice. I've heard it's so good. I've heard it's... Re- I've heard it's Josh touring in 2025. Yeah. I saw. They just announced that like yesterday or the 2025 in like a year oh, and a half gosh. from now? And I love the show. I think it's got... It's got plenty of legs. I think I think it's going to take it over Ben Platt's parade, which I've also heard is pretty nice. Um, so that's that's my bet that I'm going to put down and everyone can laugh at me um, in the future. This is my best, the narrator from Arrested Development Impression. It did not. But I would I would put money on Sweeney, the Josh Groban, Sweeney Todd taking Best Revival this year. And Josh Groban taking Best Actor? He did not. Oh, I don't know. Who else is nominated? Uh, Christian Borle, Some Like It Hot. Jay Harrison G, Some Like It Hot. Josh Groban. Brian Darcy Jameson into the wood, Ben Platten Parade, and Colton Ryan in New York, New York. I don't know well enough to be able to make a judgment on that. No, neither do no, I. No, I don't know either. And I feel like it might be weird to give it to Josh Groban. But if he's doing it, if he's doing a good job. Like, that's what I've heard. I haven't seen it. And I also haven't checked out Some Like It Hot at all. Right. Maybe I love Some Like It Hot. Maybe it's great and I'll and it'll take everything and it'll be deserved. But I, I haven't listened to it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, so let's ask our last couple questions, unless anyone has final thoughts um, before we ask these two things. Final thoughts. Um, So by going through this whole process, do you think we have figured out who this show was for? I think this show's for Andrew Lloyd Webber. Oh! (laughs) Oh! He wrote this show whilst looking in a mirror. (laughs) (laughs) Classic. Right? He's like, everybody, come read my journal. (laughs) Literally. But like, do you get what I mean by at the beginning when I said like, I feel like we can pinpoint that all the things that went wrong and eventually got to a point where I was like, I don't know who I was writing the show for. So just kept writing things. Yes. and, And then put them all together and was hoping that. And I feel like if he would have had a clear voice as to like, this is going to be a children's panto show and I'm going to make it like very childlike, mm-hmm. but it's also going to be accessible to adults. Yes. 
or vice versa where I'm like, this is clearly going to be an adult Cinderella. Yeah. I'm going to make it very adult where it's like kids are going to come in and it's like, it's going to be PG-13 Cinderella. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't that. It was just, it, w- it was just wishy-washy. So then should Bad Cinderella be a musical? Oh, totally. I think there's totally a way where you can make sin. There's, there is a twist in here somewhere that yeah. I have yet to figure out. Where you can make C- Cinderella the the bad guy, but make you still feel bad for her. It's kind of like Dear Evan Hansen. Mm-hmm. You see sure. this guy make a really bad decision, and then you follow his trajectory. The mm-hmm. problem is Cinderella's already been pre-made, so she has to eventually go to a ball. There has to be some sort of mistaken identity, mm-hmm. and then you got to find her again to and, and this like to make the relationship work out in the end. So working within those parameters. How do you make her, quote unquote, the bad guy? That's a good point, Nelson. I Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with some significant rewrites, a new composer, a new lyricist, the actual idea here is not a bad one. If we could just change everything else about the show, maybe it would work. But I don't know. I, I think I, I, again, love Emerald Fennel, so I'm like... Can we just, can she have another crack at it with a different composer lyricist? <laughs> 100%. There's something here. It's just so faint. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. So like my vote would be, no, it shouldn't be a musical. There should be a Cinderella musical that Emerald Fennel leads. Yeah. Potentially. But it would take so much. You'd have to change so much about this production. Oh, yeah. I don't think it would be recognizable as what it is anymore. Yeah, you'd have to start over really, burn it to the ground and start over. So is it a flop? Is it a secret bop or is it so bad we got to make it stop? I think it should have never come to Broadway in the first place. Mm-hmm. I think yep. it should have died on the West End. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm I'm also team make it stop. Are, yeah. are we ever gonna am I ever gonna think about Bad Cinderella after well, this? Well it's probably no. not going on tour, right? Like it's no. not gonna tour. I I don't see a lot of people at the regional level doing it. I see high schools doing it. Yeah. That's kind of where it belongs. Can you imagine a high school being like, and we're gonna have our Cinderella go into plastic surgery now? Sure. I mean like I would be hard pressed. I mean, remember Paul when our high school had a problem with us doing urine town because urine was in the title. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> surprised how much people have a problem with urine town. That's the most bizarre thing. It's so it. funny to me. It seem it's such a niche and like innocuous show to me. You know it's what I mean? Because they don't like, get it, right? It's because they don't understand. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think it's a make it stop. Unfortunately. But what's crazy is all these separate, if you look at all these creatives individually, they have all had hits. It makes sense. Yes. Like, Andrew Lloyd Webber, yeah. Um, and even David Zippel, like, City of Angels is one of my City favorite of You and me both, Nelson. Mm. Oh, yeah. I what love that What you don't know show. about women. Mm-mm. Right? That's yeah. in that? Oh. I like that song. Oh, absolutely. Like, it's just it's such a good show. They've all had hits. And so my question is... Why was it the combination of these people that were just made, that yep. made this? Look to the leader. Look to the leader. 100%. Yep. Always it starts at the top. look th- there. Yeah. <laughs> oh Nelson, my gosh. Thank you so much for joining <sighs> us on this episode. Yeah. It was really... Thank you so much oh, for having Oh, it was an absolute me. pleasure. I would love to be back. Yeah. I can't wait to do another oh, eventually. Count on it. If yes. you count on it. <laughs> We'd like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts and the Crescent Arts Centre for their generous support in this season of Monkeys and Playbills. And this brings us to the end of that season. Thank you to our listeners. Please oh. remember to rate, review, subscribe, especially if you want more monkeys in the future. What a beautiful season we had. What a fun season. It was a good one to look back at. Highs, yeah. lows, I, uh, live shows. Live that sounds shows. like a coal and canary candle. Oh, I can't wait until I loved your live show, by the way. That was so Thank cool. Thank you. We had a blast. Thank you for listening, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Hi, everyone. This is producer Daphne speaking. Thank you all so much for listening to Monkeys and Playbills, the show where we take a look at Broadway musicals that had 100 performances or fewer before closing. To learn more about the show, you can follow us on Instagram at monkeysandplaybillspod or email us at monkeysandplaybillspod at gmail.com. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash monkeysandplaybills. Monkeys and Playbills is proud to be a Village Conservatory for Music Theatre podcast. Original music for the show is provided by Paul DeGers, and the show is produced and edited by Daphne Finlayson. We wanted to give a special thank you to the Canada Council for the Arts for supporting this season of Monkeys and Playbills. 
We also want to thank our producing partners, the Crescent Art Center, for their support. To learn more about the different podcasts in the Village Conservatory family, visit villageconservatory.com or look up the Village Conservatory channel in Apple Podcasts. 